What if I told you that some of the richest and most famous billionaires are secretly criminals? Even Elon Musk, one of the most loved billionaires has something to hide, because Elon thought Twitter was a place he could say anything. But one tweet almost sent him to prison for 25 years. In 2018, Elon tweeted out that he was taking Tesla private, causing the stock price to skyrocket. But there was one issue, he was lying. And once people found out, the stock price plummeted. The government likes to call that fraud, and it comes with a maximum prison sentence of 25 years. Elon's a billionaire though, so his army of lawyers kept him out of prison, but he still had to pay a $40 million fine. And not only that, his tweets now have to be reviewed by the board before they even go out. This next billionaire though, did something so horrible that he went to prison for life. This is Alan Stanford, who was one of the wealthiest men in the world. He built his empire in the banking industry by giving people a better return on investment than anyone else. So if he gave his bank $100, he could give you back $200 when every other bank could only give you $120. You might be skeptical, but at the time, it was known as one of the safest investments ever. As Stanford's company grew, the Fed started snooping around on how he made his money. So to hide his shady business, Stanford moved his headquarters to Miami, the state known for barely any business regulation. But even that wasn't enough to shake him off leading him to flee the country to Antigua in the Caribbean. This allowed him to pay his employees more than any other bank, so he had the world's top talent in the palm of his hand. But one employee, Charles Hazlitt, started to uncover Stanford's scheme. Because when one of his clients asked where their money was going, Charles asked to see the bank's portfolio. He thought this wouldn't be an issue, since all the banks in the US are required to show this. But since they moved to Antigua, he got a suspicious answer instead. He was told they couldn't tell him where the funds were going because it was their special secret to doubling everyone's investments. But Charles wasn't happy with that answer and kept pushing. Stanford needed to keep him quiet, so he tried to make Charles more comfortable by sending him to the headquarters. But that only made Charles even more suspicious because when he got there, everything was super fancy, but it seemed like nobody was doing any work. Charles even talked to the bank manager and he was surprised to find out that he barely knew anything about banking. And with Charles' BS meter going through the roof, he decided to quit and submit a tip to the US government. But little did he know, the FBI was already on to Stanford. The feds had been listening to Stanford's phone calls, looking at his records, and had a sting operation set up to build a case on him. And they found out he was running one of the biggest Ponzi schemes in history. Turns out Stanford was taking his investors' money and spending it on private planes and gold jet skis. When it came time to pay an investor back, he used funds from a new investor instead. But it doesn't end there. They also found out he was getting drug kingpins to launder their money. Even though the FBI had all this information, they needed more to make the charges stick. But since the HQ was out of the US, it was harder than they thought. Stanford was always one step ahead of the FBI and basically became a god on the island. He paid the lead regulator 200K a year to look the other way. But eventually, Stanford just made himself the regulator so he could make his own rules. This pissed off the US government so much that they did something they've never done before. The US basically told Antigua that they needed to change their laws or else. But Stanford and Antigua called their bluff and continued to operate growing faster than ever. For about 15 years, he was paying himself like a million dollars a day, making him worth about five billion dollars. Is it fun being a billionaire? Well, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I have to say it is fun being a billionaire, I think, but, I think but it's hard work. It's hard work. But inevitably, it all came crashing down. The US had finally gotten enough evidence to charge him in 2009, and his arrest made headlines. At first, Stanford denied all the allegations. I will die and go to hell if it's a Ponzi scheme. It's no Ponzi scheme. The other allegation is that you were involved with the Mexican drug cartels. Oh, if you say it to my face again, I will punch you in the mouth. But three years later, he was convicted of 13 counts of fraud and sentenced to 110 years in prison. All of his investors lost every penny, many being old people looking for a safe retirement investment. To this day, Stanford still denies he did anything wrong. Hey, at least he got life in prison for what he did. This next billionaire made all of his money by turning people into zombies and murdering them. And it's not just one evil billionaire, it's an entire family of them. It all started when the Sacklers bought a small company called Purdue, and they developed a drug called OxyContin, one of the most powerful pain relievers on the market. The Sacklers claimed their new drug had an addiction rate of less than 1%. Less than 1% of patients taking opioids actually become addicted. But in reality, it was 13%. So in order to get FDA approval, 
It was rumored that the Sacklers took the man responsible for greenlighting these drugs into a hotel room and forced him to label it as non-addicted. Almost as soon as the drug was released, the cases of addiction began to soar, but instead of admitting their drug was addictive, they blamed it on patients not using it properly. At this point, the drug still wasn't mainstream, so their next step was to get as many people addicted as possible so they'd spend all of their money. The Sacklers advertised drugs in medical journals, gave out free pills, and incentivized pharmacists to prescribe the drug. They would fly out doctors to seminars, which is basically a free fancy vacation to get them to push the drug. And to keep regulation away, they donated millions to politicians. The Sacklers had become marketing geniuses, but the long-term effects of this drug were just beginning to surface. Oxy was expensive, so people who were addicted would run out of money and look for cheaper drugs like heroin. This was the beginning of the real zombie apocalypse, because the same people who were prescribed that drug are now in a zombie-like state in homeless camps, and eventually, many are killed by overdoses. In fact, anytime you see a homeless person on drugs, there's an 80% chance it's because of the Sacklers. But like most illegal empires, things started to fall apart. Hundreds of doctors were getting arrested for prescribing pills for no reason, other than to make a profit. But the Sacklers company Purdue still wasn't charged with anything. Years went on. But finally, in 2004, they were charged with something. Purdue was sued for deceptive marketing because they advertised the pills would last 12 hours, but they only lasted 8. This created the perfect cycle for addiction because it forced them to take more and more. To prevent a trial, Purdue agreed to settle and paid a $10 million fine, meaning they weren't required to change anything. So for three more years, Purdue was on the loose ruining people's lives until the feds came after them in 2007. And after a major lawsuit, the feds got Purdue to admit they knew their drug was addictive, and they exploited that for profit. Purdue was forced to pay a $600 million fine, but in their agreement, there was something sneaky the public wasn't aware of. The feds weren't allowed to go after the Sackler family at all, so they were off scot-free. And don't let the $600 million fine fool you. The Sacklers made billions off getting people addicted. It's estimated that the Sacklers have killed over 200,000 people, and they'll never see jail time for it. But that happened years ago. Sam Bakeman Freed created one of the biggest scams in history and just got sent to prison. There are some new facts that might shock you, but we have to start at the beginning. Sam Bakeman Freed, aka SBF, launched a crypto trading firm Alameda Research, made to carry out high-risk crypto trades with borrowed money, basically a crypto hedge fund. He found out that Bitcoin prices were higher in Japan than the US, so his firm took advantage by buying Bitcoin in the US for cheap and selling it in Japan for a profit. This worked for a while, but eventually people found out and the prices equalized. So Alameda Research had to come up with a different strategy. SPF then used some of that money to start another company, FTX, a marketplace to buy and sell crypto. FTX was advertised by trusted celebrities and billionaires as a low risk platform, meaning investors should have been able to withdraw at any time, even if FTX went bankrupt, which is the complete opposite of Alameda Research. If Alameda goes bankrupt, investors could potentially lose everything but since SBF owned both of these companies, he thought he could give Alameda some special treatment from FTX, which would give him an edge on the competition. Did he know that was illegal though? Probably. His parents are Stanford educated lawyers. Regardless, all the crypto coins continue to skyrocket, making Alameda research even more money. And being the greedy son of a bitch he is, SBF wanted to invest anything he could get his hands on, even his own customers' money. It's possible he believed that his companies were making so much, it didn't matter where the funds came from, what the expenses were, or how they kept track of it. At any point, FTX could easily give everyone their money back, right? I'm sure at its peak that was true, but it didn't take long before everything went downhill. In a matter of weeks, it seemed like all of crypto was plummeting to zero. Companies were going bankrupt left and right, and Alameda Research was still high risk trading. Sam thought he was untouchable, but if they were using an accounting firm instead of QuickBooks, they would have noticed they were going broke. Literally, you know, there's no record keeping whatsoever. Uh, they use QuickBooks, a multi-billion dollar company using QuickBooks. QuickBooks? QuickBooks. And if SBF was aware of that the whole time, why was he still trying to save failing companies? Do you still have enough cash if you needed to do another bailout? Yeah, yeah, we did. And, and we, we try to keep that on hand. Like we try not to empty the coffer, so to speak. We had a couple billion. It could have been just to make himself look better. But regardless, customers were still getting cold feet and everyone wanted their money back. And that's when it really hit Sam. There was no way he could pay back billions of dollars. So he froze everyone's account, preventing any withdrawals. But how was that even allowed? These people were guaranteed that their funds were safe in FTX. 
Well, it turns out, SBF was lending over half of their customers' funds to Alameda Research, which they would lose in trades, spend on mansions, political donations, and so much more. How could a man considered a genius be so stupid and not think he would go to jail for scamming people out of billions? You're certain that once the dust has settled and once all the investigations have happened, that you won't be arrested for fraud? I don't think I will be. I don't think I tried to do anything wrong. Recently, there's an influx of evidence that proves he was the mastermind behind all of this, which is why the government found him guilty on all seven counts of fraud. And now he's facing up to 110 years in prison. Everyday people had put their Christmas bonuses, savings, everything they had into FTX. And they lost it all because of SPF and his ego.